Um, okay. Lots of, lots of slides to get through, lots of code on these slides. I know that people in the back can't necessarily see it, so I do apologize. Um, there'll be a QR code for a GitHub repository so you can follow along at home. But we're gonna go super duper fast and hopefully leave lots of time for questions. Before we get started, disclaimer time. You probably don't need to do this, okay? The number one rule of micro-optimization is don't micro-optimize. Like you, you really probably don't need to do this. It's almost always overdone. People who do optimize usually optimize completely irrelevant things that don't actually matter. And most of the time, the largest benefits come from just being really thoughtful about how you designed the core part of your system, making sure that it's not only evolvable, but also like scales in the appropriate ways, okay? So like that's the really, really important bit, but we're skipping over all of that because it's just fun to talk about JVM internals and hardware stuff and other things that we shouldn't have to do. So here's what we're gonna be doing. We are going to be building a simplified IO. Okay, this is basically very similar design to the IO monad that's inside of Cat's Effect that people run into production right now. Um, we're gonna have uh, support for values and errors, we're gonna have supports for async, and we will have fibers, including fiber cancellation. Um, we're not gonna have on cancel, okay? Finalizers are actually where 99% of the complexity comes from, so we're not gonna talk about that stuff. Um, and what we're gonna be doing in this micro-optimization stuff is we're gonna shave some nanoseconds off of flat map. Ooh. Because we all write programs that are just one long series of flat maps. Um, so that's what we're going to be optimizing. So um, if you want to grab this, um, this is the GitHub repository. All of the code is up there. Um, I'll leave this on the screen for a second. Um, GitHub.com, DJ Spuex, Cilio. Um, the name is very intentional. Um, but this is where all the code is. I tried to keep the commit history fairly clean so you can kind of go back and forth and see where I added benchmarks and tests and things and then when I finally ran the code formatter at the end. Um, so here we go. This is, um, this is what we're gonna be implementing. Um, this is the code for uh, the IO monad. We've got flat map, handle error width, we've got start, unsafe to future, a couple of constructors on here. We're gonna implement all of this stuff um, we're gonna talk about how that implementation works, and then we're gonna optimize the living crap out of it for no good reason. Um, the very first thing I want you to see about this API is the fact that there are a million and one allocations just in the API, okay? This will become very important later, but you'll notice, like, we're putting a lot of objects around here, like IO of A, IO of B, that means we have to make an IO. Like there has to be an IO object, and we're promising that to the users, which means that no amount of black magic is going to allow us to get rid of the IOs that we have to wrap around our A's. And that is really, really annoying. So the API is like super, super, super limiting. It's great for usability, it's very pleasant for everybody who's going to use the library, but really annoying for those of us who are writing the library, and we really wish the API were something else. Anyway. Um, uh, so, uh, one of the things to keep in mind with this whole example, like I kind of poked fun of earlier about like nobody writes programs that are giant chains of flat maps. When you're using the IO monad, you are probably using it to do networking. You're probably writing some sort of like HTTP thing, because that's most of what we do these days. And network IO is much, 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 much slower than anything you could possibly do with flat map. So like, we are really optimizing the wrong thing here, and that's a very important thing to keep in mind. So here we go. Rule number one of, of optimization is don't do it. Rule number two of optimization, figure out what is actually slow, and then optimize that, don't optimize other things. Well, we're already breaking both of those rules because we're doing micro-optimization and we're optimizing something which is completely irrelevant. But we're doing it anyway, because it's, it's like really actually very fun. So, if we're gonna optimize stuff, we need to first build an intuition about what are the things in computers that are fast and we should do more of them, and what are the things in computers that are slow and we should do less of those, okay? So fundamentally, all performance, or lack thereof, stems from physical factors. It's easy to forget with your TikToks and your AWSs, but like there's actual physical hardware like under the surface, it's not just VMs all the way down, right? So like, what does a clock cycle mean? And what operations are actually implemented in silicon versus emulated in the operating system? Like, these are questions that actually start to matter when you're optimizing things at these level. How fast do electrons move? 
That's actually a really good question, and it starts to become very, very important at these layers. There are many, many, many layers of abstraction, and layers of hardware between us and anything physically tangible. Like we live in this like floofy software space. Even if you ignore things like cloud providers, like there's a lot of layers here, right? So at the top of this sort of pyramid of layers, you have the user application, right? The thing that we're actually writing. And then underneath that, you're gonna get the Scala compiler and the JVM, and then under and these all add like their own layers of abstraction, right? Like when you write a line of Scala code, it's like, like 400 lines of bytecode. And then when you sort of take apart the bytecode, that's like a zillion, zillion, zillion assembly instructions and whatever your underlying hardware is. So that's its own thing. And then the operating system kernel comes in and like layer is scheduling and preemption and sort of cache management on top of that. That's its own sort of complexities of weirdness, takes you further and further away from the problem space. And then finally, all of this gets gifted like a baby on the doorstep to the actual physical hardware. And the actual physical hardware then looks at it and decides it's going to do something completely different because that's what modern CPUs do apparently. Um, and you're just sitting up here like wondering how you can actually make any of this do what you want it to do. So we're so insulated away from this stuff. Every single one of these layers makes assumptions about how things are gonna work. Like basically they're gonna have a happy path and they're gonna have an unhappy path and they're gonna really want you to live in that happy path. Violating the assumptions triggers the unhappy path. Think cache eviction, for example, right? Like if you're not accessing data which is highly proximate in memory, then you're gonna cause a lot of cache eviction, which means your L2 and your L3 caches don't matter. And unhappy paths in modern, software and modern hardware are usually many orders of magnitude slower than the happy paths. Like we're not talking about a difference between one nanosecond and two nanoseconds, we're talking about the difference between one nanosecond and like 400 microseconds. Like it's, it's really, really very dramatic. Most things that are fast are fast not because they are branded with C, but because they are friendly to the underlying assumptions, okay? So they just match up with the assumptions of this giant pyramid with the eye on top. And most things that are slow are slow because they flout these expectations. So when some lower layer is expecting something and you do the opposite of that, it's gonna be really slow. And spoiler alert, we do the opposite of the assumptions all the time. So what is slow? Well, allocation is really, really, really slow. When you call new, on the JVM, it's incredibly slow, mostly because the heap is arranged essentially at random. So I kind of foreshadowed just a second ago where I was like, okay, well, one of the assumptions that hardware makes is like cache eviction and you're accessing data that's really proximate. The heap is not proximate to anything. Okay, you access one like object and you access another object and it's like way the heck over here and that blows away the entire cache line. So all the assumptions that the operating system makes, that the sort of processor makes, they kind of all go away. And if that wasn't bad enough, the JVM makes it worse because object construction requires memory barriers. And so you like create a new object and like memory gets published, that means the processors need to talk to each other and that's super, super bad. And to make matters even, 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 even more worse, heat management, including garbage collection, has an amortized cost. So the more stuff you put on your heap, the more expensive it is, that's more time the GC thread is taking and eventually you thrash and your service like, metrics go completely terrible and you wonder what you're doing with your life. Um, so allocation is bad. Like if there is one thing for you to take away from this talk about how to optimize code in Scala, it's that the new keyword is the devil, don't do it, okay? The other thing that's really slow, and there's actually a bunch of these, but like the other thing that's really slow is indirection, okay? Now, it, we don't usually think about pointers in a first class way um, in Scala or in Java, but obviously in C, you think about this a lot. We're like, oh, okay, I don't actually have a thing in my hand. I have a pointer to a thing, and I'm gonna have to dereference that and go away. Everything that's an object in Scala is a pointer, and you have to follow that on the heap to like figure out what the heck is going on. That's really slow because C.1, heap arrangement is generally random. So if you're taking a theme away from here, like the heap is bad, like the, the heap is real, real bad, don't use it. Um, just generally don't touch these things. Okay, so that's a lot of pessimistic things and there's more slow things that we could talk about as well, but we're in a hurry. Um, what is fast, okay? What things should we be doing more of? Well, number one, anything that's primitive, okay? Int, boolean, byte, long. Um, 
Actually, that's pretty much it. Um, the, uh, some of the other primitives are not as good. Um, there, there's actually, it's really funny, like some of the primitives are actually unprivileged on a JVM because it converts them into other primitives in order to for, operate on them, and then certain optimizations don't actually work. So there's like primitives, and then there's really, really primitives. You wanna be using the really, really primitives. Um, so that's really, really good. Intrinsics. So this is like a word that maybe you might not have heard too much about, but like certain operations on the JVM are implemented as um, operating system and often CPU level intrinsics. So for example, things like you know, addition, subtraction, these are obvious, but what about stuff like array copy, right? Or random, these are actually intrinsics that run very, very fast inside of the kernel. These are great things to use. Do not use things which pretend to be intrinsic and are not. So Scala math is a very deceptive package that is living out there, inviting you to use it. Stop. Please stop using Scala.math. Java.math works just fine and is about 10,000 times faster. Like it's not even, it's not even remotely comparable. Um, and the reason being that Scala.math is all intrinsic. So when you say Scala.math. Well, or Java.math.min, um, or Java.ling.math.min, um, what happens is that delegates down to the processor, the processor implements it in silicon, and it runs in like seven or eight clock cycles or something like that. If you use Scala.math.min, then what ends up happening is the JVM can't look through it completely, so it can't totally inline the underlying Java math call, which means that instead of seven clock cycles, it takes several hundred clock cycles because it has to do an object dereference and like a method call, and then like a, again, the heap is still random, and like it does all this terrible stuff. So don't use Scala.math. Just like literally like search or place that out of your code. Okay, ranch over. Arrays. Arrays are really good. As good as you think arrays are, they are better. Um, they are just super, super good. Why? Because they're not random. <laughs> they're like these contiguous chunks of memory. And so like, again, it's like soup fits super well with the assumptions of the underlying operating system. Final thing that's really, really fast that is like some people think is actually slow, method calls. So method calls are really, 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 really fast on the JVM. Even polymorphic method calls are really, 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 really fast. Um, the Netty framework actually takes advantage of this um, by encoding pipelines using method calls. And in fact, this is kind of a general trick you can play. If you have something that's really, really performance sensitive, and it's like you're representing it as a bunch of objects and like some data structure that you interpret or something like that, you can use the visitor pattern instead of the interpreter pattern to pull out my gang of four references. And the visitor pattern is many orders of magnitude faster because it all turns into method calls and the object representations go away. So pro tip. All right, moving forward. I, talked, I promised I was gonna talk about IO, and that's what we're gonna do. The rest of this talk is gonna be like concrete things. So actually I'm gonna pause a second. Anybody have questions about the like conceptual things that I just threw out there? Because we're gonna be like in code land for the rest of our lives. One question right there. Why don't we deprecate Scala.math was the question. Ollie, you were too slow. Um, the, uh, uh, I, I, I actually think that some of the Scala maintainers don't realize how slow it is. Like there's kind of this intuition that the JVM is gonna inline it and you don't realize it doesn't inline it until you actually look at the assembly code that Hotspot is generating. So like, there's just a bunch of these sorts of things, and it, 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 this isn't the only one, there's like zillions of them, like not only in Scala, but also in the JDK, and like just traps that you have to avoid. Other questions? All right, we're moving on. Um, so let's implement ourselves an IO. So if you've ever wondered how cats affect IO is implemented, this is actually gonna be a pretty good primer in about five minutes because we are gonna talk about the fundamental concepts behind how it works and how you would build it if you weren't trying to optimize anything. So step number one, let's implement the object. Um, so we're gonna implement a couple constructors here, pure, razor, async, and all we're doing, if you can see the code at the bottom, which I think only the people in the first row can see, is we're actually creating new case classes for each and every one of them. So we've got a pure case class that extends IO, we've got an error case class that extends IO. We're just making objects. Now remember, I told you don't make objects. We're doing it anyway because the API is forcing us to because the API is terrible. And we continue this pattern in the, the abstract class, right? So flat map becomes 
make a new io.flat map. Handle error width becomes make a new io.handle error width, right? We're just making these objects. And the only thing that's actually interesting in this whole implementation is unsafe to future, which is the thing that actually runs the io, right? Or starts it running, rather. Specifically, what we do is these two bits of it are the important part, OK? So we make an IO fiber, and then we register a listener on it with the onComplete method on IO fiber, which is not part of the public API, but it's part of the internal API that we are going to implement. And then we submit it to the executor, and off it goes on its merry way, OK? So we haven't really talked about IO fiber yet. So what actually is IO fiber? Well, it is an executing IO. Okay, its job is to take an IO object and run it until it's either canceled or errored or produces a result. And that result is going to go into the listener or listeners plural. So whoever's listening to this fiber is going to get one of three outcomes, value errored or canceled. And we're going to maintain an invariant, which is that this fiber can only be on a single thread at a time. Okay, there could be a fiber that's on no thread at all. It's like waiting to run. Um, but if a fiber is running, only one thread has it. And that assumption is actually very important because what that allows us to do is it allows us to avoid synchronization. It allows us to avoid volatile. It allows us to avoid memory publication and other problems that we would have inside of the fiber because we know, because we're just assuming, that the fiber will only be on one thread at a time. So just kind of remember that assumption right there. So with that in mind, Here's the implementation, or at least the top part of it. Okay? So we have an IO fiber. It takes the current IO. So when you sort of make an IO fiber, you know, give it an IO to run. Um, and then it's got some variables that actually maintain stuff. Okay? So the, sort of the current IO, like what are we executing right now? Continuations, listeners, canceled, blah, blah, blah. The interesting one is continuations. Okay, so all of IO Fiber basically revolves around this list of continuations, which is a list of functions from either throwable any to IO of any. Now, the concept behind this continuation stack, and it is a stack, not a list, we're just sort of using the, the data structure, but the concept behind this is basically like when I run an IO and I get a value, I'm going to send, I'm going to pop a thing off of the continuation stack, and I'm going to hand that value to that thing, and then it can decide what to do with it by giving me the next IO to run. So this is how we're going to encode the thing. The reason I'm doing this will become apparent in just a second. I was just kind of thinking ahead a little bit when I did this. So this is the data structures. Here is the run method. Okay. Now, IO Fiber implements runnable. We can just submit it to an executor. And the run method, um, wow, the glare is terrible. Um, the run method sort of does exactly what you would think. Okay. So it takes current, and it pattern matches on it, and it looks to see, number one, is current null? If current is null, let's treat that as a, a termination signal and just stop running. Uh, number two, is current pure? If current, current is pure, then we have a value, and we can just give it to the continuation, and it will give us the next I.O., and then we loop around on run once again. If that was the last thing we needed to do, then the next I.O. will be null, and we'll stop, right? Same thing with errors. Same thing with flat map, okay? So when flat map down at the bottom, what flat map does is it pushes a continuation onto this stack. So the function that you pass to flat map becomes a continuation that says, I got a value, now I'm going to run and give you the next I.O., which is exactly the signature of flat map, right? And then in the meantime, run the current I.O. and get me that value. So that's kind of how flat map works. Um, so specifically, it kind of boils down to this. So here's the implementation of continue down at the bottom and push down really at the bottom. Um, I hope you have the GitHub repository. Um, and what we're doing here, so we've got pure and we've got flat map. And what's happening here, you should imagine this is like, imagine we do an io.pure.flat map and then some function that like computes a new IO. Well, what's going to happen is the io.pure will be interpreted in that left box there which will get the value out and call continue. Continue pops off the continuation stack and then sends that value to the continuation, which was set up by flat map on the right. Flat map set up the continuation to take that value and invoke the function that was passed to flat map, which gives you the next IO, and then you loop around and you do run. Anybody have any questions about what you just saw? 
Okay, that's all we're gonna talk about the concepts. Um, oh, actually no, I lied, we're gonna talk about async. So async is the reason we're doing all of this, okay? If we were just doing like a normal free monad or something that just had pure and flat map and stuff, then this would be really, really easy and we wouldn't mess around with the continuation stack. But because we have async, which forces us to give someone else a callback that completes an IO, we have to have this whole continuation mechanism. And specifically, we're trying to do this bit that I've highlighted right here which is like the callback that we hand to the user who has called io.async, that callback will invoke the continuation stack. So in a sense, the way that async works is the same way that pure works, it's just that pure runs the callback right away, and async will run the callback when your network socket closes or something. Hand wave. Okay. All right, so that's IO. Well, what we're going to be doing for the rest of the talk is we're going to make it, be making that look a lot uglier. Um, but first, we need to start measuring, okay? So just like you wouldn't modify code without writing unit tests, right? Um, you also would not optimize code without measuring how long it actually takes to run. And this is where things get really, really hairy, but we'll get to that in a second. So first off, there's a really nice plugin called SPTJMH. Uh, which is what literally everybody uses to do this when you're optimizing Scala. So here are the magic incantations. You put that in your plugins.spt, you put that in your build.spt, and away you go. Um, and specifically, you can use this kind of like a unit testing tool for performance. And it factors out a lot of the vagaries of JVM, like weirdness and system clock stuff and like other things like that. There's still some problems. We'll get to that in a second, but you know, it does a really good job. It's much better than calling system.currentTimeMillies and then system.currentTimeMillies and subtracting. Stop doing that, use JMH. Now specifically what we're going to be writing tests for to measure is two cases of flat map. Because remember, as we all know, everybody's programs are just a long series of flat maps and that's the only thing that matters. So we're going to optimize two cases of flat map, left and right associative. So we're gonna skip over the monad laws, but basically when you're writing a program using flat map, there's two different ways you can structure it. You can either say foo dot flat map, close paren, dot flat map, close paren, dot flat map, close paren, blah. That's a left associated flat map, and you can kind of see that going down the left side of the screen there. Or you can say foo dot flat map, and then inside of there, flat map, and then inside of that lambda, flat map, paren, 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 paren. That second one is a right associated flat map and it's going down the right side of the screen. These are two separate cases, okay? So they actually, they, they produce the same program and you can transform one into the other, but from the runtime standpoint, they're gonna do slightly different things inside of IO Fiber. So we have to measure them differently. And the way that you write these tests inside of JMH is basically the following, okay? So here's for right flat map, here's for left flat map, you put some annotations on some methods because it's a Java API and that's terrible. Um, and what we're gonna do is we're just gonna call unsafe run sync, which I didn't show you, but it does the thing that you expect it does, um, pass it the global executor. And really the actual tests are like right here, okay? So for the right flat map, we have a loop that just kind of loops inside of the lambda. So we're sort of building that right facing tree. And for the left map, flat map, we accumulate an IO by looping on the left side of the dot, okay? So it's a left associated and a right associated flat map. Before we go any further, please allow me to reproduce the text that JMH prints to standard error and very much expects you to read every time it produces output. These numbers are just data, okay? And you should read this on your own time because we don't have time, but down at the bottom there's a really, really important one. Do not assume the numbers tell you what you want them to tell. Micro benchmarks are very, very deceptive. We're gonna talk about this more in a second, but micro benchmarks are actually terrible. Um, so be really, really careful with this power that I have given you, which you will now wield indiscriminately. Um, all right, so, Open question, um, we've got our IO implementation, we've got our benchmarks, what's the thing we wanna do? We wanna run the benchmarks and figure out what the results are, and it looks like this. That seems meaningful. I don't know what that means. Okay, all micro benchmarks are very narrow performance tests, okay? This is really important to understand. A micro benchmark is basically like a single assertion. What does one assertion mean in MUnit? Absolutely nothing. 
It means that an expression evaluated to true. So what that expression is and how you chose it, that's the thing that matters. So you really have to take metro micro benchmarks in context. By design, they amplify really, really small signal and factor out the rest of the noise. And whether or not that signal means something in the grand cosmological scheme of things, you need to decide that. Okay? So you can't devoid, devoid the numbers from the thinking. No micro benchmark seat can actually capture all realistic behavior. At the end of the day, you need to take your application and you need to like measure it end to end. Like touch it the way your customers will touch it, look at your metrics, look at your P99s, like look at whatever it is you measure success by. That's what you need to optimize and JMH can't help you with that. So please keep this in mind. Additionally, numbers of any sort are only meaningful as a relative comparison. So we kind of laughed about the previous page where I just showed you two bars, but they're literally not meaningful. The only thing that will be meaningful is when we begin to make changes and we see how those bars actually move around. So definitely remember that. Final warning, do not under any circumstances do this on Apple hardware. <laughs> This is so bad. Okay, so Apple's hardware is wonderful and really, really, really impressive, and I love it, it's the best laptop I've ever had. But, so fanboys don't come for me. Um, but here's the problem. Apple Silicon is very unique. There is no other processor which currently on the market behaves like Apple Silicon from a hardware standpoint. And this is true on a number of different levels. So the numbers that you get from Apple Silicon are wildly, wildly inaccurate unless you are literally running your application on Apple Silicon. And last time I checked, we don't plug our laptops into AWS. So like, don't benchmark on Apple Silicon. Um, there's also other problems with like the big little architecture and things like that, but just really don't do it. All of the numbers in this presentation come from a T2 large uh, instance in EC2. I actually did run, just for fun, I ran all of the benchmarks on my laptop just to see, and the numbers were hysterically off. Like, things that actually made the EC2 instance better made it worse on my laptop. Like, it's just literally don't do it. it you will get so confused. All right, all of the disclaimers are out of the way. We are all on the same page about what we're doing and the fact that we really shouldn't be doing it, but we're gonna do it anyway. So now it's time to iterate. We're gonna make five optimizations and we're gonna walk through why it make, what we're doing, why it makes things better, and we're gonna show the results and get those sweet endorphins going as the bar charts go up and the tweets go higher. So allocation-free stack. This is gonna be the very first one. So, I talked in the beginning about how allocation is super, super bad, right? Like the new keyword on the JVM basically destroys your performance. And if you remember, at the heart of the IO fiber is this continuation stack, which is a list of either throwable function, like this is allocations out the wazoo, right? Like we're making so many objects just to have like this stack. And it would be kind of nice to get rid of some of them, I don't know, like start sort of chipping away at this. And the very first allocation that we should be thinking about is the list. So list, remember, list is encoded as an ADT that has two cases. There's S nil, which doesn't allocate because it's a singleton, and, and cons, oh, sorry, not S, it, Guillaume's talk is sort of stuck in my head. There's nil, and there, yeah, it's your fault. Uh, so there's nil, and there's cons. And cons is actually the thing that allocates. So every time we push something onto the stack, we allocate a new object that sort of wraps around the stack and the object that we're pushing onto the stack, and that's bad. So here's the question. Can we create a stack that doesn't allocate at all? And remember, the stack has to be potentially unbounded because we might have like a lot of continuations or we might have a few continuations. So how many people think we can actually do that? Like make a stack without allocating? Raise your hand. All right, and how many people are non-believers? The Venn diagram of non-participants in this talk is very large. Okay, so um, can we implement one without allocating? Yes, we can. We can do this, um, sort of. We're gonna, <laughs> so you were both right. Um, the trick is basically to use dynamic arrays. So if you think all the way back to your computer science courses, um, dynamic arrays, the trick works by you grow the array until you run out of space, and then you double the size of the array. You copy everything from the old array into the new one, and then you keep going. And then when you hit the, the bound on that one, you double it again, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the argument is 
that because you're doubling every time, it becomes exponentially less likely that you will hit the end of the array. So even though it's very expensive to copy the arrays, you're doing it a logarithmic number of time as your array increases in size, and therefore it amortizes to O of one, which in our terms means zero allocation, asterisk. More importantly, remember what I said about arrays being way better than you think they are? They are, okay? Allocating and copying arrays is really, really, really fast. And the reason for this is intrinsics. So remember I used like, I poked fun at Scala.math and then I used array copy as an example of something that's really good. Array copy is really good because what array copy actually does is it's implemented as physical silicon on your CPU. Because copying arrays around is so common, it's actually implemented as a, like a physical operation, a part of your processor in all modern processors. So that's actually pretty fantastic because it means that you, we can use this and get the best performance that electrons in silicon can give us. And that is gonna be way, way, way better than your like piddly new cons, you know, heap, uh, you know, next gen thing. Okay, so here's what it looks like. So we're gonna make this thing called a ray stack, okay? And it's got a buffer, which is a var, and we don't have to make this a volatile or lock on this, by the way, remember, because fibers are only on one thread at a time. So all of this can be just stack on, or uh, thread unsafe. So we've got uh, a buffer, we're gonna start it at size 16, because I said so, um, we've got a length, and then we've got push and pop operations, and that's all we have to do. We're not gonna shrink the array, which if you remember back to your computer science courses was always the hard part. Um, the, um, the push operation is just gonna grow that size indefinitely. And this, this actually kind of creates, by the way, a sneaky little optimization that's hard to uh, analyze, which is that fibers kind of have a warm up period. Like you grow the stack up to like the right place for that fiber, however you wrote the fiber, and then it'll probably stop growing. And then different fibers might have different stack sizes, but once they reach that sort of steady state, it's probably gonna stop growing that array. And then you just have an array that you don't touch ever again, except to like put things into and take it out of it. It's really, really great. And hey, mutation is awesome. Um, so down at the bottom is that check and grow function. <laughs> And the check and grow function just does the thing you would expect. It compares the length, um, and I'm not doing a greater than because I'm not feeling defensive. Um, makes a new buffer that's twice the size. System.arrayCopy, not array.copy. Array.copy has the same problem as Scala.map. So you system.arrayCopy, you move those contents over. This will be ludicrously fast on absolutely every major system. Um, and then we reset the buffer. Once we're over here down in IO Fiber land, it's really, really easy to use a ray stack instead of the list, which is sort of like push onto it. And we can now run our fancy benchmarks and the endorphins begin to rise. <laughs> Twitter wouldn't like that. Um, that's bad. That's, that's actually kind of odd. Why did it get worse? Um, I don't know. So I actually, um, so I was preparing this talk, and I kid you not, I spent literally all of the time on this talk trying to figure out why this made it worse. So you, if we actually look at the results, like right associated flag map actually did get better, and we'll talk about that more in a second, because that's kind of what we would expect, right? We got rid of some allocations, so like, seems like it should get better, but left associated flat map got worse by like 4x. So like, that's really, really odd, and I don't really understand why. Um, I tried different array bounds, I tried all sorts of different crazy things. The only thing I didn't do is hook up a disassembler to Hotspot and actually look at the assembly code that it's generating. If I did that, it would probably produce the answer, and we can't have that. So exercise for the reader. Learn how to hook a dis disassembler up to Hotspot. Um, what probably happened here is we probably were previously falling into one of Hotspot's weird happy pads. So sometimes when you're using the JVM, you will land yourself in a case where like the inliner and the escape analysis and like everything in C2 just happens to line up so perfectly and like everything just works and it turns into magic fairy dust. When you're in that state, it's actually really, really fragile um, so like it's pretty easy to bump yourself out of that. And if we had not been writing a program that's a giant chain of flat maps, we probably would have gotten knocked out of that happy path. Um, 
But for the purposes of this test, that's a problem. That is just a hypothesis, though. Hooking up a disassembler would probably answer the question. Exercise for the reader, send me a pull request. Um, in case you were curious, x86 and ARM both showed similar dips here. Again, really not sure why. Um, but this is fun. Anyway, if it is a happy path, then a different benchmark or say, I don't know, a realistic piece of software probably wouldn't have this. Like it probably wouldn't be in the happy path, which means it would probably have always been slow, meaning we wouldn't have this situation where it feels like we made things worse when we actually made things better. That's what I'm saying to make me sleep at night. Um, does it matter? I don't know. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. This again is the problem with micro benchmarks. What do they tell you? Shrug. Um, Something to keep in mind, four comprehensions are right associative. So if we're gonna choose a case to optimize for, left or right associated, let's optimize for right associated because that's the one that almost everybody writes. In fact, left associated stack maps are, left associated flat maps are not stack safe. So generally people avoid them anyway. So like, again, if we're gonna throw one of these cases under the bus, this is the case to throw under the bus. Um, yeah, long series of flat maps, micro benchmark barrage, blah, 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 blah. We're gonna keep going anyway. I don't know why it got slower, but we're gonna make the other things faster. This is kind of the credo of optimization, right? Like at some point you're gonna make something worse and you're just gonna decide to keep going anyway because it's fun. Next optimization we're gonna do, allocation-free continuations, okay? So remember that what we are pushing onto our continuation stack are function values, okay? They're functions from either throwable any to IO of any. Well, you make functions by allocating. Allocations are bad, so can we get rid of those allocations? Well, the answer is basically yes. So we really only have three different types of continuations that could ever possibly happen inside this fiber. It's not like we're being fed functions from the outside. We are in control of what goes onto this stack. And the three different continuations we have are flat map, handle error with, and fiber completion. Okay, so the fiber is done executing, notify the listeners. So we don't need arbitrary functions. And there's a lesson in this. The lesson is basically this, as programmers, we very often write highly general versions of the code that we're touching. And we're just kind of trained to do that to the point where we don't even think about it. But more general things are generally slower, generally. So a really easy way for you to find better performance in your code is just make things more specialized. Make it more special case to the problem you're trying to solve and you will probably find some like coins in the couch cushions. So specifically, what are we gonna do? Well, we're gonna take this and we're gonna turn it into this. So we're gonna make a new one of these array stacks called a byte stack, okay? It's gonna be the same as the other array stack, just with array of byte rather than array of any ref. And what we're gonna do is we're going to push, um, every time we are pushing a continuation, um, we're going to push a byte onto the byte stack. And that byte will indicate which of the three continuations we're talking about. Flat map, handle error with, or fiber continuation. The very first one we have to push is fiber termination, which is terminus k. And then the continue function is gonna pop off that stack and it's gonna do the colon at switch thing, which everybody should know about, but most people don't. But like, do at switch, it's really, really good. Um, and this is gonna look at the byte that we took off of the continuation stack and figure out which continuation we have to run and run that continuation. Add at switch with the file with the read for you. Not always. Um, Guillaume basically said, if you don't add at switch, the compiler will do it for you. And um, it really doesn't always do it. Um, I wish it did. Um, it, this might be one of those things that got a lot better in Scala 3. Um, I can, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. I think also this is kind of like tail rack in a sense, where like, I really don't want this to compile if it's not a switch. We'll talk. Yeah, exactly. We'll talk more about like why at switch is so good in a little bit. Like we're gonna have a special optimization around that. But just suffice it to say, it's good. Now, with this encoding, we have a little bit of a problem. So remember that the continuation for flat map needs to invoke the function that was passed to flat map. Well, now our continuations are just bytes and we're not allocating something around that. So how do we make sure that when we invoke flat map k, we actually get the function that was passed to flat map. Well, we do it with this object state thing. 
So the object state thing contains the state that's in the closures for the continuation. So when we do flat map, we do two pushes. We push into the state with the function that was passed to flat map, and we push into the continuation stack with the one byte, which indicates our continuation. And then down into flat map K, which is what we're gonna run when we hit that continuation, we pop back off of the stack, regardless of whether it's an error or a value, and if it's a value, we invoke that, we cast it, and then invoke that function. Embrace casting, casting is your friend. Types are the devil. If there's one thing to take away from this talk, it's like mutation is good, arrays are good, types are bad, use C, like that's just basically where we're going at this point. So um, what is this bias? Um, it made things better. And look, the blue line kind of went up too. So like, I don't know, great success. Um, at this point, we, we've actually like made things pretty meaningfully better. We're like 60, 70% improved over our baseline. So like that's not small and we're not done. Okay, optimization number three, allocation-free results. Are you sensing a theme here? Like every optimization seems to be about removing allocations and it will be so for you as well. So in our functions, you know, if you look at the continue function, if you look at flat map K, we have this either that we have to pass around and that either indicates, well, if it's a left, it means we got an error, and so the flat map should short circuit. And if it's a right, it means we got a value, and the flat map should run. Well, that's really annoying because it means we have to create an either. So we, you know, someone's got to do like, you know, actually I clicked and I went forward. Someone's got to do like new left or new right, and that's very very expensive. So how about we just don't do that? What what if you want a value that's nullable? An IO of throwable. That's a really good question. Well, if you have an IO of throwable, I think it works just fine. So I'll show you. This is how it works. So the encoding here is we have two parameters to the function. Now this kind of falls into like some of what I said earlier, which is that function invocation is a lot faster than allocation. So we're just making our functions more complicated so we have fewer objects. The way that this works is we test to see if it's an error by looking to see if the error is null. That's how it works. So if the error is null, then it must be a value. Now the value could also be null because people could do IO pure null and we have to make sure that works, but no one can do IO raise error null because no one is that evil. Um, so this works and we can get rid of the left and right. We can sort of hide this way. Now remember, you wouldn't put this in user facing code, but the only users that have to consume this are like Armin and me and you know, we don't count. So, um, so here we go. So we can do this, we can remove that allocation. And now at this point, I want to, we've kind of reached a milestone. The run loop for the IO fiber does not allocate now. Like we have an allocation free stack, we have allocation free continuations, we have allocation free results. We don't allocate at all. The only allocations are that stupid API that returns IO of A and IO of B and all that other functional nonsense. That's making us allocate, but the IO fiber itself is not. And the results are great. Like we made it better. The blue line just sort of still checking in. Um, but the green line's good. Focus on the green line, please. I'm gonna tweet the green line. All right, moving forward, pattern matching. So remember, at the heart of the IO fiber run method is a giant like match case function. Well, what does that actually do, okay? So let's look at this code right here. So case pure value, blah, 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 case error value, what does this actually compile into? Does anybody other than Guillaume know what this turns into? I think, I think people actually shouted the correct answer, but like, um, it's right here on the screen. So for all of you who are very fluent in bytecode, um, this is the bits that are actually interesting. It's basically the equivalent of a long series of if else's. So it's basically if is instance of pure, else if is instance of error, else if is instance of flat map. That's the whole thing. Now, this is kind of okay for an IO that only has five cases, but the cat's effect IO actually has like 19. Um, and that gets really, 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 really slow. And it turns out that even with five cases, we can do a lot better. And the way we do better is by reading history books. Because in Scala 2.7, 
there was a different compiler backend which used something called tagging on case classes. And this is a really, really cool trick. So what we do is we put a def tag int on every single one of these case classes. So def tag int zero, def tag int one. We have a different number for every single one of the cases. And by the way, it is actually important that the numbers are consecutive. Don't just pick random things. Consecutive numbers are handled by hotspot differently than non-consecutive ones. Anyway, so we do this for all of them. And then what we do is we come back into run and we change our pretty pattern match into this ugly monstrosity that does current.tag at switch case zero, case one, and we cast in each one. And what this does is it transforms our bytecode that we previously saw into this work of art. And this work of art is so nice because we've got a giant table switch in the middle there which basically has every IO case correspondent to a jump. And what will happen here is we do an invoke virtual up at the top and then we'll jump to like one of these two places. So here's the invoke virtual right up there. So we call dot tag, we get the tag value, and then we jump to the right thing. Now remember what I said earlier about function dispatch being really fast. This is function dispatch and it's really, really fast. Like technically speaking, we're hiding some indirection inside the JVM by doing this. Like the JVM actually has to have a lookup table to figure out which case we're in. It kind of does its equivalent of a pattern match. But the JVM is much faster at doing that than we are. So it turns out that this actually makes the green bar go up a little bit. And if IO were bigger, like it is in Cat's Effect, it would make it go up more. If I remember correctly in Cat's Effect, this increases performance by about 20%. So it's a really, really big optimization. Guillaume asked the very interesting question. Have you tried using a val instead of a def? And the answer is yes, and it makes the performance worse. And the reason the val, so it's kind of unintuitive, but the reason the val makes the performance worse is because it makes the allocations more expensive. So every time we allocate those terrible IOA, IOB, like IOC, like the things that people use in their code and whatever, um, like those all have the tag val then and all of that's just a little bit more expensive because you have 32 bits more memory that has to be sort of shoveled out of the heap. Good question though. Final, final round. More stack, less heap. So the heap is bad. Maybe that's like the, the real subtext of this talk is that heaps are terrible, we just shouldn't use them, but like the heap is really, really slow. And we are currently doing quite a bit of things with the heap inside of IO Fiber. Specifically, we have that current thing. So every time we loop around through run, we call current, which is a field inside of IO Fiber, which is on the heap. Now, disclaimer time, Hotspot does some very, very clever things with fields. So much of the time, Hotspot will move your fields into registers, and like it's not really that big of a deal, so you really shouldn't overthink this optimization, but th in this talk, we're overthinking every optimization, so we're gonna do it anyway. Um, what we can do here, <coughs> in most cases, rather than having current be a field, we could actually just have current be a parameter of the method. And this is way, way better. Now we can't do that when we go out to the executor, right? Because at that point, we're not on the stack anymore, we're off of the thread, like, so it has to be written into the field there. But for most cases, like when we're doing everybody's ubiquitous long chain of flat maps, um, we don't have to get off of the thread, and so we just have a single value to worry about. And it turns out, this actually makes things way, way faster. So by moving current into a function parameter, rather than just having a var that we're constantly rewriting in the class body, that actually makes things a little bit quicker. Now, please understand, this will not always make things faster. So sometimes Hotspot will treat var, like local fields, and function parameters the same. So you, you really have to crack open the disassembler to figure out what's going on. But in this particular case, it did make it better. So, and the blue line is just still moribund. Um, so with all of these words, um, here are my takeaways. Okay, so f first off, good high-level design is the really important thing. Like, I kind of skipped over that step, but like, we started off with a continuation stack. We started off with a pattern match and a run loop that was tail recursive. 
Those were design decisions that I made in advance because we didn't have time to talk about it, but it's very different from how we used to build things like the IO monad, and that opens up a world of optimization possibilities. Always try to align your assumptions to the underlying hardware. Why? Because that's what the hardware is doing, and the hardware is going to make its unassumed cases much, much worse in order to make the assumed cases better. So try to be in that happy path. Allocations are awful. Allocations are so bad. Don't allocate. Like, that's the easiest way to get more performance. Um, Micro-optimizations are not a good idea. Like, I realize that's like kind of the whole point of this talk, but you really don't want to be doing this stuff 99.9% .9 of the time. And if you're in that 0.1%, I promise you, you will know that you are in that 0.1%. Just don't do this. Most of the time, you will end up making things much, much worse, and you will gain almost nothing, except endorphins and sort of Twitter clout. Think before you act, okay? This is, I don't know, this is a good rule, like, entirely, but um, think before you do things. Like, some of these things, like the fact that we kind of ruined left optimi left associated flat map and stuff like that, we kind of had these arguments about, well, people don't actually write long chains of flat maps, blah, 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 but we're going to do it anyway. If we were really thinking critically an hour ago, we wouldn't have wasted all this time optimizing flat map, because it really doesn't matter. Like, people are just going to burn all of that in network I.O. anyway. Um, Optimization usually involves trade-offs. We made left-associated flat map worse in order to make right-associated flat map much, much better. And we decided to flip that switch on the trolley problem. Like, that was okay because right-associated flat map is more common. But you see, there was no micro benchmark that captured that intuition. Like, what I just said there, that's an observation about the way that Scala like, desugars for comprehensions. It's an observation about the community and how it writes code. It's an observation about my personal applications and my anecdotes. I thought about it, and that's what led me to that conclusion. Thinking really, really, really matters in this stuff. So think down, like sit down and analyze what you're doing and make sure you're actually making things better rather than just making a meaningless number better. Um, we have eight whole minutes for questions, I think, unless Holly is telling me that we don't have eight minutes. Are you going to make me sad? No, we do. Thank you for your talk. And anyone?